Um, welcome everyone. My name is Anne Flynn Schlicht. I'm the director here at the Center for Women's Entrepreneurship at Chatham University. And thank you for joining us today. Um, this is part two of a training series we're offering on steps in buying and selling a business. Last week, we had the steps in buying a business. This week, we're going to be talking about selling a business. And we're delighted to welcome back our presenter, Jacqueline Gore Jordan Core, who is a partner with the Lynch Law Group. Uh, welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you for coming back and joining us this week. So we're excited to hear about selling a business this week. If you missed last week, uh, the recording is up on our website on the event page where you registered for the series. Uh, we also sent out the link in the recording of the recording in the follow-up email. Same thing for today. This webinar is recorded. You will be emailed a link with the recording and I also ask that you please fill out the evaluation, the online evaluation as well. So give us some feedback, help us to develop more programming to meet your needs. All right. So um, my name, as I mentioned, is Anne Flynn Schlicht. I'm director for the Center for Women's Entrepreneurship. And joining me online today is Mitra, who is our program coordinator. Uh, and also online, we have Kate Booker, Michelle Price uh, with the center. And then we have two graduate students. And we put this picture up since we are virtual and have been probably for the past year. You get a feel of who we are and, and, and put uh, faces to our voices as well. So. Um, delighted everyone is here with us today. So if you're new to the center, um, the Center for Women's Entrepreneurship celebrated 15 years uh, in the fall of 2020. Uh, we have really grown our programming over the last 15 years. Uh, we provide training programs like the one here today. We have a wonderful membership program. We actually have a prototype and design lab as well at our center. Uh, our center is located at Chatham University's East Side building, which is on the corner of Fifth. And we hope to be back in person at the center and offering programs come late summer, fall. So um, but really expanded our services. And we'll tell you a bit more about who we are and what we do in a few minutes. So all of the programming we bring to you and all the business counseling and technical assistance is thanks to the many supporters that we have. Our center is funded in part to a cooperative agreement with the Small Business Administration. We also are funded to a number of different foundations, both locally and nationally. They include the Claude Warrington Benham Foundation, BNY Mellon Foundation, the Hillman Family Foundation, the Pittsburgh Foundation, PNC Foundation, and the Kent Rockwell Foundation. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also receive support from corporate sponsors, and we're very thankful for their support over the years. Our diamond sponsors include PNC Bank and UPMC Helpline. Gold sponsors are Bridgeway Capital. Our silver sponsors are the Mussolini Financial Group the URA, which is the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Pittsburgh, Mario Unific and Scott, which is a law firm. Then our bronze sponsors include Enterprise Bank and Community Bank, uh, Herbine and Company, which is a CPA firm, and then WBE Collective, which is the Women Business Enterprise Collective. Our media sponsors include Pittsburgh Magazine, Pittsburgh Business Times, and 90.5 WESA. And our WB Collective is a collective of women-owned businesses that have given back to our center over the years, both in terms of financial contributions as sponsors, but also in terms of their expertise and knowledge being facilitators for training programs and also for our counseling technical assistance. So, uh, as I mentioned, we've really expanded our programming over the last few years. Uh, we've lots of different programming, whether you're a startup business, we have our signature concept launch, which is our six week startup training program. We offer it multiple times a year. Usually it's capped at 25 attendees. Uh, it's nearly full for every session. Um, so if you're a startup, I would encourage you to look at that. Um, we also have a program called Breaking Down the Business Plan, which is a six week course to helping you um, get your business plan together. Uh, we're offering that as a summer boot camp uh, in June, so a shorter version, like a three hour. Um, we have a uh, we have a web workshop this webinar, I should say, this Saturday is uh, Build Your Business. We offer it a number of times a year with SCORE. Uh, we have a First Leap, which is a program for the 
businesses in the creative arts, which we offer in collaboration with Bridgeway Capitals, Creative Business Accelerator. And if you're a growing business, we have our roadmap to 1 million and beyond to help businesses scale and grow. Our Women Business Leaders Breakfast Series, we've been hosting for over 10 years now. Uh, that's the second Friday of every month. Uh, we have a woman, different speaker, sometimes a panel, sometimes individual female speaker and talking about how they've grown and scaled their company. Um, and that has been a live stream for the last year. So uh, one of our programmings is membership. So our membership program, again, is over 10 years old. Uh, we've really grown the membership program and the benefits we provide to members um, and really scaled it over the years. One of the benefits we provide to the members is a member of the month. And every month we recognize this member, both on our training programs, on our website, on our marketing materials, and it helps them promote and market their business. And um, this month, our member is Karen Kendell, and she is the founder and owner of East End Tech Concierge, a technology troubleshooting training company that helps residentials, residents, small businesses, and nonprofits navigate the ever-changing world of technology and indeed has been ever changing in this last year. I'm sure all of us has used more technology than we, we've ever thought we would. So um, please reach out to Karen, check out her business. May not be something you need, but maybe a friend or family or business needs and keep her in mind. And we have the link to her business on our website right now. So one of the things we put together very early on in the COVID-19 pandemic is a small business resource page. So if you go to our website, you see that yellow tab at the top. And when you click on that, a number of different tabs will open up. And we've put information up there on, um, you know, all the different training programs we've done regarding COVID-19. Uh, those webinars are all recorded and uploaded there. We also have uh, under the tab, the federal government support. So all the government programs regarding the PPP, uh, pay pay Paycheck Protection Program, uh, also the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. So all updates that we get from the SBA are updated there. Also from a state level and local level, if there's grants or loan programs to co recover from COVID-19, we upload them. And then we have a special section for food-based businesses because we've been doing a lot of work on food businesses and we received a grant from the Hillman Family Foundation to work with food businesses. So you will see a lot of training programs on our website for food businesses. But if you know a food business um, or have a friend, please encourage them to check that out. Great resources available. And we continue to offer one-on-one -on -one counseling services, both for COVID-19, loan programs, resources, and recovery. Um, so for those that may be looking for forgiveness now, looking for other funding to help grow their business, um, there was a available, and uh, I know there's open slots uh, for the rest of May and June online. So check those out if you need them. So one of the things that differentiates our center from other service providers is we provide free one-on-one -on -one business counseling and technical assistance. So the business counseling we offer is general business counseling, whether you're in business or looking to start a business and need to just kind of talk through the concept with somebody. Um, we also then have technical assistance. So this is specialized topics. Uh, we have counselors who can help you with business management, digital marketing if you're looking to grow your business online, uh, website development, social media, accounting, we always are, are uh, have lots of accounting questions, legal uh, questions as well, HR, branding and marketing, getting your message across and how you position yourself. Diversity certification relates to if you're interested in getting your business certified as a woman owned, minority owned or veteran owned business. And then we also have a funding clinic. So we launched this last year, and this is for people who are looking for funding to maybe grow their business or refinance existing funding that they have. Um, there's slots available every month for that. And now we've added new counseling services for food industry, both general business counseling and marketing. So we have business experts who are knowledgeable in these areas um, to help you, and all of these um, counseling services are free. You do schedule online, but they are available to you for free. So um, on to our topic today, which is about selling your business. And we are again delighted to have Jacqueline with us. Um, and Jacqueline said, if you have questions as we go along, 
please type them into the chat feature and we can address the questions as we go along. Jacqueline and I will keep an eye on it. We'll revert to the chat feature and we'll take questions at the end as well. But if you have a specific question as we go along, please do type it into the chat feature. Jacqueline. Hi, it's my privilege to be with all of you uh, here today. If you missed uh, last week, please feel free to check out that recording. If you did not attend last week because you already had a business and weren't thinking you might buy one, just one thing to keep in mind is that one way to grow your business is sometimes through acquisition, through buying a business. So certainly uh, just keep in mind that as a resource, if you ever decide that you might want to try to grow your business uh, through buying, there's some great information on there. And it is really intended to be a general overview and today is as well. Uh, one of the things that I'm happy to offer is, is that if there's anyone who's listening and you would like to um, have a one-on-one -on -one chat with me, I'm happy to do that at no cost to you. Just to really take a deeper dive into your individual situation, we're happy to address those with you. Sometimes you might have a question or a situation that you don't want to type into the chat box or don't want to discuss in a group, and um, I'm happy to do a complimentary consultation with you about that. And so having talked a little bit about why you might have wanted to watch last week's webinar, even if you already have a business, um, we should mention if you have tuned in, but you're thinking in your head, I'm not really looking to sell my business right now, but or I don't even have a business yet, but I guess I'll listen. Um, I wanted to just say a quick word about why this could be useful. So it's really useful to know a little bit about selling a business. And we'll talk about how this can change how you operate your business as you go through. And also, you never know when somebody might call you and make an unsolicited offer to you. Um, and you might want to consider selling. So it's great to have a general overview. So even if you're thinking, um, I'm not really quite um, ready yet, um, hearing this information and learning a little bit more can be really useful for you. And again, we're going to try to take a high level overview of the process today. It can be a little overwhelming. So we're going to try to balance that line of keeping this both a uh, a 20,000 foot view that gives you a great overview and also digging in a little bit to give you some of the details you need uh, to fully understand. So let's go ahead and get started. So the decision to sell, um, it's important to say here that the decision to sell really has two dimensions. So this can be very personal. Um, business owners get very, very invested in their business. It becomes a part of you. Often people have all um, or a large part of their retirement invested in their business. Because when they have profits from the business, they reinvest those profits to grow the business, to sustain the business. And so the money that they have gets tied up in the business. And as a result of that, the business sometimes is the retirement of the owner. And so as we talk today, I just wanted to point out that we're going to be talking both about the personal dimension of the decision to sell your business and also the business dimension of the decision to sell your business uh, because both sides are equally important as we go along. So when might you appropriately make this decision? Well, timing is everything here. And one thing to keep in mind is if you have decided you want to sell and you haven't done anything towards that process, that's okay. It can be okay. But um, I encourage people to really start thinking about this early. Uh, you see here that we really can talk about operating for two different reasons. So a lot of times when you are operating your small business, you're really trying to leverage deductions that are available to you. You're trying to operate as efficiently as possible. And you're not really concerned with how much profit it looks like your business is making. You want your business to make money, but there are other benefits to uh, potentially decreasing the profitability of your business, like having to pay less taxes. Um, things change a little bit when you're looking to sell your business. I, I make an analogy sometimes for sellers, and it's a bit of a crude analogy. I am 100% aware that it's not completely accurate, but sometimes um, people get a little deduction happy, not deducting anything inappropriate, but deducting anything that they can deduct from their taxes as an expense, which reduces the income 
of their business or the appearance of profitability sometimes. First of all, you should know that if you have done that, there is a process when you go to sell your business of adding back some of those expenses um, into the profitability of the business so a potential buyer can see what you've done. But I sometimes tell people that if you deduct something to save a few cents on the dollar today and that dollar doesn't make it into your revenue, unless you can make that kind of recapture later, you've given up a multiple on the, on that dollar a few years down the road. And I use that analogy to say that if you're saving 40 cents, whatever it might be on the dollar today, because you've made that deduction, instead of getting $4, a multiple of that dollar, if it stayed in as profit, you can see there's a huge differential there on the value of that deduction. And that's not to say that there is a right or a wrong way to do this. These are very personal decisions made in conjunction with your accountant. I just want you to be thinking about the impact of those decisions as you move toward sale and maybe even talking about how those can be done in a way that they could be added back or recaptured if possible, if that's possible, um, having those discussions with your accountant as you go along. So two different ways of operating, operating to maximize the profitability, the operational profitability of your business, which might mean looking like you're making a little less money and operating to position your business for sale. And so the things that you really want to be thinking about in terms of positioning that business for sale are, does your business appear to be on a growth trajectory? And so people want to buy success. And so you want your business to look profitable. You want it to be profitable, of course, but you really want it to appear as profitable as it can. You want to have your best foot forward and you want to be able to articulate that your business is poised for continued growth. And so those are some of the things that form the context of what we're going to be talking about today. So factors that impact value. So one of the first questions that people always ask when they come and say, I'm ready to sell my business uh, is what is it worth? <laughs> and that's often not quite as easy as, um, as you might think it would be. Your business is worth what someone will pay for it. And that's the bottom line. And so um, I would encourage you to really, if you're thinking about selling, dig into the value of your individual business. Don't get caught in the trap where you talk to somebody at the gym who might have sold their business and they tell you what, what multiple they got and, and how they calculated the value of their business. Business values vary by industry. They vary by business size. And they also even um, vary by buyer. So depending on who's buying your business when you go to sell it, the value can be different to different buyers. And so if you're selling to somebody who wants to be an operator, that business might be less valuable than somebody who is what we call a strategic buyer. And so a strategic buyer could be somebody who's looking to add your business onto theirs as a strategic addition. And that could be that they're buying your customer base or that they really like your business location, or you have some really great people. They, they want to buy your staff. Maybe that includes you even, um, but they really want the human capital that's involved with your business. Or it could be that you're somewhere in their supply chain. You're supplying to them something that they're using then to create a value added product. And so those we refer to as strategic buyers. And you see factors that impact value here um, can vary business to business. So recurring revenue and revenue, obviously how much money your business makes um, is one of the things that's going to determine its value most. Recurring revenue, and this means that you have some stream of income for your business that comes over and over again to you. And this could be repeat customers. It could be if you have a subscription service, that's sort of traditional recurring revenue. Um, but anything that brings money in the door on a routine basis. So if you think about, say, an accounting firm, recurring revenue are the customers whose taxes you do every year. Or if you have an IT consulting firm, recurring revenue would be people that 
pay you a retainer or people that you go in and you service their computers on a regular basis. Um, HVAC, it would be people for whom you do quarterly maintenance. So these things are all recurring revenue. Other factors that very directly impact the value of your business are your property. Um, do you own it? Is, it? is it property that people might like to own? Or even if you don't own it, people selling a business sometimes underestimate how valuable the location of their leased property can be. So if you are running a storefront, some people might not have any property and that also might be of added value. If you can run your business without having to have a, loca a physical location, that's one less expense. So that can be of added value as well. And so you really need to look carefully at what your property situation is. And if you're going to sell, you wanna think about how can you spin that best to, um, for it to be the greatest value to a potential buyer? And then of course your assets. Um, what do you have that you use to run your business? And this doesn't have to be things, right? It doesn't have to be your computers. It could also be your people. It could be your customer list. It could be your goodwill in the community. If people really love you and they've loved doing business with you, that goodwill can carry over. And so these are direct factors that impact value. And then next we're gonna look at some indirect factors that impact value as well. So other factors that impact value are things that could potentially drive the value of your business down. And these are things that sometimes owners don't think about when they're looking to sell. And these also are factors that if you're listening and you're thinking, oh my gosh, that's my business, what do I do? You can fix these things. And that's part of the reason why we encourage people to talk early. And so the first is customer concentration. So do you do most of your business with a single or with very few or with one really large customer such that if that customer account was lost, the value of your business or the revenue of your business would go down substantially. Now, in some ways, the dream for all businesses is to have that really big, great customer that will carry you. And so that can be an asset for you but you also want to make sure that you're promoting diversification of your customer base so that you can demonstrate that if that one customer was lost, it's not going to dramatically impact the value of your business. Also, you want to think about whether those customer relationships are concentrated with you. So not just the concentration in terms of what percentage of your revenue they make up, but also the concentration in terms of who is that customer's contact with the business. And this is when we start talking about the issue of owner dependence. And owner dependence is something that can relate to your customer base and also to the operations. One of the things I love the most about working with entrepreneurs, um, and it's the best part of my job is working with business owners and people that really love their business and, um, and becoming kind of part of that team and feeling like you're really a part of the business. But often owners, especially people who start a business, people who are in a startup, who might be bootstrapping their, um, their business to get it off the ground with their own money, with their own resources, they will be a jack of all trades. They'll do everything. And that's often very necessary in the early stages of a business. So you might be the one making the sales calls. You might be the one doing the accounting. You might be writing the payroll checks. If you have employees, you might be the one doing the social media. You, you might be the one cleaning the bathrooms. And that might all be necessary early on. But as your business grows, many owners find it difficult to get rid of some of those tasks, to delegate them down, to share those tasks with others. I mean, I think most people probably can share the cleaning of the bathroom pretty easily, but maybe not so easily share the sales relationships or um, share management of employees or operational decisions. But if you are an owner and you are the heart and soul of the business and Everything that happens at the business starts and stops with you. 
then somebody looking to buy your business sees a high level of owner dependence. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about owner dependence. And the question then becomes, if I'm buying your business, can I step in and can I be all things to all people? Can I be the salesperson? Can I be the finance person? Can I run the operations? Can I supervise the people? And a lot of buyers will quickly find that to be overwhelming. And so one of the things I'm always encouraging business owners to ask as they're moving towards sale is, what am I doing and do I need to do all of it? Could that task be shared with someone else? The same is true, not just for owner dependents, but for individual positions. Cross train your people. I cannot talk enough about the importance of cross training your people when you go to sell your business. If you are a small business and you have one person who does all the finances and you might say, well, that's not me. So I don't have owner dependence. Does anybody other than that person know how to do the finances of the business? So if that person does all the invoicing, it's scary for a buyer if there's no other person in the business who knows how to do the invoicing. And so really what you want to do is create a structure to the extent possible where there's at least one other person who can do every person's job. And, you know, especially I think as, as professionals, as entrepreneurs, as uh, people who are driven to, to start and operate businesses, we often are proud of our ability to do everything. And the other thing is there's something that seems great about being indispensable. The business needs me, right? But what you want to create is a situation where the business doesn't need you. And that, returning to what I said we were going to talk about two dimensions, the personal dimension and the business dimension, that can be really hard. You don't want to create a situation where you're dispensable and the business doesn't need you. But in terms of selling your business, that's the very best thing you can do is be able to say to a buyer, my team has this. They can do it. I can turn them over to you and they can run this smoothly without me here. They don't need me. Because then the person knows that they're buying a fully functional business that they can focus if they're buying as an operator on what they want to focus on. Um, but they're not going to be stuck doing every task of the business. They don't have to learn everything at once. It seems a lot less overwhelming. And it can really increase the value of your business. So these issues of customer concentration and owner dependence can be really important in terms of the value of your business or the desire of a potential buyer, how attractive your business looks as a target to potential buyers. So preparing for sale, let's get down a little bit to the nuts and bolts. What um, on earth do you do to begin to prepare your business? Well, there are two sides of this, um, a financial side and a legal side. And those are, other than this diversification of operations we've been talking about, those are the two big things that involve actually preparing for the sale, getting your financial house in order and getting your legal house in order. And so I wanted to talk about these things in the context of things that happen once you find a buyer during the sale process, because the best thing you can do to position yourself for sale is to do everything or to have everything ready that you will need to have in the sale process in advance. Uh, we sometimes say in mergers and acquisitions, which is about 70% of what I do, um, we say that the fastest thing to kill a deal is financing. That is the, the buyer can't come up with the money. And the next fastest thing is time. And what we mean by that is that if things happen in the sale process that slow the process down, that maybe raise a red flag or that cause buyers to have to think critically about the value of the deal, whether they want to buy the business, time kills the deal. So you really want to be as prepared as you can. So when you find a buyer and you sign the letter of intent, which is a document we're gonna talk about in a minute, uh, when you get that signature and you are off to the races to sell your business, 
you really want to be ready and prepared for everything to move smoothly. And that means um, the best way to position yourself is to engage your accounting team and your legal team in advance of sale. One of the things that sometimes is requested on the financial side, and it's maybe not done in a formal way, uh, there's a formal quality of earnings report that can be done to say, is this real revenue? How does this business really look like it's operating? And you can engage an accountant to do that in, in the context of the sale. And, and buyers will often do that to try to figure out the quality of your earnings. But really, the financial diligence, are your balance sheets in order? Have you been deducting the toilet paper from your house? <laughs> what, what's your business look like in terms of how it's running, um, its profitability, its revenue margins, its recurring revenue? Are your accounting practices good? Um, are your books accurate? Do you have a bunch of journal entries in there where you might be explaining why numbers don't match? Um, and really, do you have your the finances of the business locked down so that when people look at them, they see a clear and accurate picture of how your business is running and that there aren't things on there that don't belong on there, that everything that needs to be on there is on there, that it's accurately represented and that it's very clear and easy to read. And you don't want people to be asking questions about how the financial statements look or how they were maintained. So you, it is important to get your house in order. And I know as business owners, the most important thing, and this was true of me when I was in the C-suite, I, I used to walk in when I was a CEO and ask my finance director every single morning, how's the cash? Because the most important thing was, can we pay the bills, right? And so you always want to know how the cash is. And sometimes as an owner, if the cash is good, you don't worry about much else financially. And so if that's you, there's, there's no shame in that. That's many, many business owners. But you might want to work with an, your accountant or your finance director or whoever you have as a resource to make sure that your books really look good, that there aren't any questions, that your tax returns accurately reflect everything um, and that every you you've paid every tax you need to pay you don't have any outstanding debts um, that you're not aware of and so those are all financial things that you want to lock down on the legal side the same is true and so during the process of sale you'll go through a process that we call diligence and basically what happens here is that the buyer is going to give you a list of items that they want related to your business. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this and what kind of items might be requested. But basically, they're going to ask you about things like your, your insurance, your, um, your lease or your real property, your contracts. Are you registered to do business in every state where, you're, where you are doing business? Um, have you filed your decennial report? If, if you um, have been in business longer than 10 years, I'll give you a little value add to tell you that 2021 is a decennial report year. And so if you've been in business longer than 10 years, you have a, a report that you need to file with the state. Don't panic if you haven't filed it. You have all of 2021 to get that filed. But if you've been in business 10 years, you need that. And those are the kinds of things that buyers, lawyers, are going to ask to your lawyer in the sale process. So one of the things that we often do for clients who are looking to sell is a process we call reverse diligence. And reverse diligence is exactly what it sounds like. We take you through that same process in reverse before the sale we can anticipate very easily the documents that you're going to be asked to provide and the questions you're going to be asked in the diligence process. And so you're either going to have to do it as a part of the sale or in advance of the sale. So doing reverse diligence does not cost you any additional money. What it does is it helps you get everything organized and get all your legal ducks in a row so that when, and you can do this with your financial advisors on the financial side too, so that when that buyer comes to you and says, we're interested in buying, here's the list of things that we'd like to have and a list of questions we'd like you to answer. You have everything ready to go. 
and you're not scrambling because you're realizing then that you didn't file that decennial report or that you're not registered to do business everywhere you're doing business or that you are maybe doing some business on a handshake and you don't have a contract and a buyer is going to want you to have one. And so we can fix all those things in advance. And what that does is it compresses the time of your transaction. So that time from when you sign your letter of intent to when you close the transaction becomes shorter because the diligence process takes less time. And because time kills the deal, it makes it more likely that we can successfully get you to close when you have all your ducks in a row in advance. And so this is the best piece of free legal advice I have to give you is if you are thinking about selling, consider going through this reverse process with your legal advisors and your financial advisors to see how does my business look right now to a potential buyer and what things might be red, red flag and can I get those fixed in advance. So the location of your business, I touched on this a little bit previously. Location can mean a lot. The kind of lease you have, whether your lease can be assigned if you are renting property and you don't own. If you own property, are you going to keep that property and you're going to do a lease with the new owners? Are you looking to sell the property as part of the business? Are you flexible? So I have a client right now who is buying a business and the seller originally wanted to sell the property and the business. And the buyer we're representing said, I don't want to buy the property. I might want to move the location of the business. I just want to lease the property. And the buyer said, okay, I'm flexible. I'll be willing to do that. Thinking through some of those things in advance and knowing if you own the property, would you be willing to hold on to it and accept rent? Some people, that's great. It gives them some additional revenue beyond the close of the business and they're happy to have that other people want to be done they don't want to hold on to the property there are ways that you can structure a lease so that you don't get stuck paying the taxes so that you don't pay the insurance and so that you don't pay the maintenance that's called a triple net lease and so there are options you can talk about with your um, with your advisors to put you in the best position but definitely something to consider as you go through this process. So planning for life after your transaction. So we're going to talk about the documents that form the transaction. But as you look to sell, I wanted to talk about this a little earlier before we actually talk about the transaction documents, because I think it is so important. So on the personal side, one of the best things that you can do for yourself is to figure out before you sell your business, what life looks like the day after you've sold the business. So you've handed the keys over to someone else and potentially you've walked away. What are you going to do with your time? And there's no right or wrong answer here. This is very personal. And some people say, I just want to spend time watching my grandkids. Some people say, I want to travel the world. Some people say, I, I'm ready for my next business. I'm going to reinvest in another business. And other people have no idea what they're going to do. And that's okay if you don't have any idea, but you really want to spend some time figuring it out. A high percentage of business owners a year after sale, it's I think 80 or 85% of business owners say they have regrets over selling their business. Now, you're probably gonna have some regrets and other things you're gonna be super excited about. What we wanna do though, is we want to minimize the number of regrets you have over the sale of your business. And so that means knowing what life after the sale looks like. And there are a couple of options that can impact whether you just end with the closing and walk away, or you have some continued involvement, either financially or personally with the business. And so sometimes sales will be structured with a promissory note where people are gonna pay you a certain amount of cash at closing, and then they're gonna continue to make payments to you. Sometimes those will be based on your revenue and they'll be variable and might go up or down depending on whether the business makes money. 
Those can be capped. They can have a floor and a ceiling, but that's a way to get some ongoing money after the sale. And then also sometimes there's a role for you to continue in the company. And that could be through a consulting contract where you're staying on to help with the transition. It's very typical for people to stay on for some period of time. Sometimes that's as little as two weeks. Sometimes it's a year. Usually it's not more than 18 months, but sometimes consulting contracts do go on longer than that. Sometimes owners will stay on in a different role. So you've been the owner and now you're going to just stay on in a sales role because you have a great relationship with the customers. And so there are opportunities for you to stay involved in the business. And sometimes people don't realize that. They think if they sell the business, it means they have to walk away. And it doesn't mean you have to entirely walk away. Those are things that um, we can do with the structure of your sale to help you have the kind of exit that you want to have. An important point here, if you do not have a financial planner, many, many business owners do not have a financial planner because all of their finances are tied up in the business. So it is not unusual to have people sell relatively large businesses where they're collecting millions of dollars and not have a financial planner because all of their money has been reinvested in the business. And so if you're in that position, you are not alone. Uh, but I encourage you to find a financial planner and to take a look at if this is your last business, like you're selling to retire, how much money do you need? And is the sale going to provide for that? Or do you need to find another way to bridge that? And so keep in mind, you could consult for your own company, or you could also go on and have a consulting business for like companies. And we'll talk about some restrictions on that uh, coming up here that you want to consider in the sale process. So potential structures, how your uh, sale gets structured is going to depend on what kind of business you have. So if you have um, an LLC, then what you own in your LLC is called membership interest. And if you have a corporation, you have stock. And so your sale would either be a sale of membership interest or a sale of stock if you are selling the company. And what I mean by if you're selling the company is that if you have Jane's LLC and when you're done, you're not going to own Jane's LLC. The buyer is going to own Jane's LLC. That's a sale of the company. It would be a membership interest sale. If you own Bob Inc., and at the end of the sale, you're not going to own Bob Inc. The buyer is going to own Bob Inc. That's because it's a corporation, a stock sale. But you can also just sell the assets of your business. And that means that after you are done with the sale, you still own Jane LLC, but you don't know, own any of the business assets. You don't own the customers. You don't own the equipment. You don't own most of the things that were necessary to sell the business or, or to operate the business rather. Um, and the same can be true with a corporation that you could just be selling the assets. No, at this point in time, I don't wanna to get too technical here, but know that there is a difference between an equity sale, interest or stock and an asset sale. And that those have different tax implications for the buyer and for the seller. And so, your deal can potentially be structured to reduce capital gains tax. And that's something you want to just know about and work with your advisors in advance. Sometimes people will find a buyer and they'll strike a deal without talking with their financial and legal advisors. And the deal they strike, they'll end up finding out is not the deal that has the greatest tax advantage, or they'll not know that they could have maintained some income. And they'll give up things because they didn't have that deal team involved early in the process. So there really are real benefits to talking through these things before you sign on the dotted line to sell your business. And then also just know that it is possible for you to own or finance part or whole of this of this business. And that does come with some risk, but there are things that can be done to mitigate that risk. Um, so a lot of people will say, well, I can't do a promissory note. I can't own or finance this because 
you know, there's not, I don't want to lose all my money. What if they never pay me? We can put protections in place to make sure that they will pay you uh, or to try to put you in the best position and minimize the risk. So whether you have a, a promissory note or some portion of the deal that is self-financed may depend on whether you have a lender that requires some portion of it to be self-financed. Sometimes some lenders do. And also may also just depend on how, um, how you are in the process of making that transition, right? And so what, what, does, that, what does that look like as, as you go along? Um, and do you have enough money that you don't need that cash at closing that you can afford to finance part of it um, on the personal side? So your sale documents, what do the documents look like that are part of the actual sale? Um, so there are essentially five categories of documents here. You won't have all of them in every deal. The IOI, um, this stands for indication of interest. This is a very early document where somebody might come to you and say, I'm interested in buying your business and here's what I might be willing to pay. The IOI doesn't always happen. Sometimes those discussions are more informal, but I wanted to make you aware of it uh, because sometimes people will get an indication of interest and it will be marked an indication of interest and they will think they have um, or an indication of intent. Sometimes people call it and they'll think they have a letter of intent and they don't. <laughs> so be aware that those are two separate things. Um, IOIs don't often happen. The NDA um, or non-disclosure agreement is an agreement that allows you to share financial information and even potential trade secret information with a potential buyer. Um, so if you have a secret recipe or a special way you do something or you have a patent and before somebody is going to be willing to buy your business, they're going to want to see that. You want to make sure you have a really strong non-disclosure agreement in place that will prohibit them from using the information if they don't buy your business. Um, this also is the document that keeps the actual negotiations over the sale um, secret. So you may not want your employees to know that you're talking with a potential buyer. And this is what says, hey, we can't publish in the newspaper that we're trying to buy this business. The letter of intent is after you have kind of hashed out the details, there's a formal letter sent this is, uh, you are going to receive this as the seller. This is drafted by the buyer and it's going to come to you and say, I'd like to buy your business under these terms. Something you should know is that this is negotiable and good M&A lawyers will put into this letter of intent a lot of wrinkles that will go into the purchase agreement to really provide strong protections for buyers. So you want to make sure you know what every word of that letter intent means before you sign it, um, because you might be signing away rights that um, you don't know you're signing away. I will tell you that the letter of intent is largely non-binding. It should give you the opportunity um, to go through the diligence process and give the buyer the opportunity to walk away if they don't like what they find. And that's another reason that reverse diligence is so important. But the reality is here, you want to be sure that that document is as favorable to you as it can be. Then you're going to have a purchase agreement that's going to reflect, and that's going to be sometimes called the definitive document, reflect the terms of the deal. And this can be an agreement that is signed in advance of the closing. That's called an asynchronous sign and close or signed the day of the closing. And that is called a simultaneous sign and close. A simultaneous sign and close is cheaper from a legal fee perspective. It is simpler. It requires less documentation. If there isn't any reason you need to sign your document in advance, I encourage you to try to pursue a simultaneous sign and close because it will save you money and it will be simpler. And then the ancillary documents that will get attached are things like the lease of the property, if you have a consulting agreement, if there's a promissory note, if there's a security agreement that goes with that promissory note, those are things that get attached and that we refer to as ancillary documents. So non-competes and non-solicitation, a word about this. 
So a non-compete basically means after you sell this business, you will not open a business doing the exact same thing next door. Um, so sometimes there isn't a non-compete, but you need to understand that if there is a non-compete, you really want to know what that means for you, because sometimes it will be a prohibition of you working in the industry. Courts don't like non-competes and they don't like, they're a little bit better with non-solicitation. We'll talk about that in a minute, but they really don't like non-competes because they don't want people to be restricted from earning a living. So you want to make sure that if you enter into a non-compete as a seller, that it is narrowly drafted both geographically in terms of what you cannot can, can and cannot do and temporally. So three different facets, the geography of it. So sometimes it'll say within a hundred mile radius. Sometimes it'll say within Allegheny County. Sometimes it'll say anywhere where the company has uh, customers. So it can be crafted very differently. Um, how long does it last? And be aware that if you're getting a consulting agreement, you probably have two different non-competes, one for the business and one for you individually as a consultant. And then also, in addition to this geographic territory and the time, what are and aren't you allowed to do according to that agreement? So this is something that you want to negotiate very carefully. Non-solicitation means you cannot uh, steal those employees after you leave. So you can't to start a competing business come and take employees away. It also means in, from that um, NDA that we talked about, that if the person decides not to buy your business, that they can't come back and steal the employees to run their own business or to work in their own business. And so that's something that we want to include for your protection in the NDA as well. So we've reviewed some of these, um, but just a, an overview here of big picture things that I want you to keep in mind as you look to potentially sell. First is what are the tax consequences of the sale? Many people look at the sale price and they think that's the amount I'm going to get. I'm selling my business for 2 million, so I'm getting 2 million, but you're definitely not getting 2 million. <laughs> um, Usually there are, there's some debt that has to be paid off because most businesses are bought cash-free, debt-free, which means if you have a mortgage, that mortgage, or you have a business loan or a line of credit, those things have to be paid off out of the sale proceeds. So those have to be deducted. Also, you have to think about what tax consequences you might have as a seller. Do you need to pay capital gains tax? And you need to do that math with your accountant. So you know, not just the sale price in your head, but what you're going to walk away with. That's, that's in many ways the more important number than just the sale price. And then financial planning, making sure that you have a plan for that money. Life after sale, making sure you know what you're going to do with your time and that money after you walk away from the business. And then just to keep in mind that you're leaving the business with great experience about how to run this individual business and how to work in this industry. And so when it comes to those uh, non-competes, you might want to think about whether you want to preserve to yourself um, the ability to consult in this industry. A lot of people want to do that. It, does, it could be with, with the business you're selling. It could also be with completely separate businesses, but you want to think about whether there's a potential consultant role for you. So that is a really high level overview, lots of information presented really quickly. Again, you see on here, you can feel free to contact me and I'm happy to schedule a call with you to discuss your individual situation. I have my email listed here. You can always uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or reach out on LinkedIn. If you felt like it was a ton of information, fortunately, um, Anne and her team are kind enough to upload um, the, the webinars to their page. So they'll be there um, in the future, but you will also get an email from Mitra giving you a link to the recording, which is really wonderful. Um, so you can go back and you can rewatch it if you want, 
But if you have specific questions or you want clarification on anything, please feel free to reach out. And did we get any questions in the chat? Yeah, box? we just got one question. I didn't interrupt you because uh, it was a more general question. And it's just, a, you know, and it's, it's something I think has come up before, but if working with a legal or financial advisor to sell or buy a business in either case, is it important to work with someone in your state? It is not. It's actually not important to work with someone in your state. Um, not unless you, there's litigation or there's something where you have to have an individual representat representation where somebody has to enter an appearance. And so, for example, we do mergers and acquisitions work all over the world. We just... Um, we just closed three deals in British Columbia and we have a UK cross-border deal right now. And um, we just did a Nevada deal and we just um, assisted with the purchase of a, of a Hispanic foods company in Florida. And so you don't have to work with somebody in your state for mergers and acquisitions work or contract work. So to do the leases and the consulting agreements, it, those people do not have to be in your state. It's more important that you have a great relationship that those people communicate with you very clearly, um, that you're comfortable with those people and have a relationship with them and, and feel you can get the answers you need and that you have somebody with good M&A experience. So that's what I would say on the financial and the accounting side is that mergers and acquisitions, sometimes called M&A, is very specialized. And so you don't want to use your your the person who did your divorce <laughs> to sell your business. Mm -hmm. Trust me, you don't want to use me to do your divorce either. So that goes in both directions, but it's very specialized work and you want to make sure that um, somebody is doing it that understands you so you get appropriately protected in the process. And I think, you know, as well, you brought up a lot of different, um, you know, good pointers today. Someone who's gone through the process over and over and over again, so is able to help you overcome those hurdles that you might address. I think one of the questions we get a lot is, and maybe you can answer this, um, is lead time, you know, so because there's a lot of like due diligence that has to be done in selling a business. Um, you know, in terms of what is the lead time usually look like? And what are some things that all might slow up the process? Yeah, so we tell people, and this sometimes shocks people. So if you're listening and you're shocked, you won't be alone. Uh, but we tell people to really think about the sale of your business three to five years in advance of the time when you want to sell. Um, because there are things you might want to change the way you're doing deductions or you're accounting for things, or you might want to change your advertising and you want to have enough time to do that. And if you have issues, you want to have time to fix any potential red flags. Having said that, from um, the time when you get your letter of intent signed to closing is going to vary a lot based on your team and how hard they push. And so we try to push nicely, but as nice as we can, but we try to push to get transactions closed. We want to be waiting on the bank, waiting on the financing to come through. SBA financing takes longer mm -hmm. than conventional financing. So you're looking at 45 days at a bare minimum, usually 60 to 90 days to close an SBA loan. Um, but aside from SBA deals, we try to move from letter of intent to closing on deals under $2 million in 30 days. And so the more we can compress that time, the less your legal fees will be because you'll be talking to me less often and the other side won't be asking as many questions. And, and so it just, it decreases fees, it decreases risk in the transaction and we're really trying to get people to close. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you again. I, I know we're getting very into our, to the end uh, of our time here and we have a few things to announce for upcoming events. So thank you again, Jacqueline, for a wonderful presentation both last week and this week. We'll make sure everybody gets the recordings and you too. And, um, you know, I'm, and I'm sure, you know, people now will maybe start um, thinking about these, uh, these areas and, and maybe reaching out and hopefully three to five years out, you know, have good planning in place. So thank you. So upcoming events. Um, so we have a webinar this Saturday in partnership with SCORE. 
and the corner launch box in New Kensington, uh, which is about early stage for early stage business, businesses, going through the key um, things you need to know if you're starting out in business, whether it's starting from scratch or buying a business. Um, and that is this Saturday from 9 to 11.30. And I know we have a huge turnout already for this webinar. So, but we still have spaces available. So if interested, please sign up. Um, then we have our next uh, program is in June. So we're heading into June now. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, our uh, business plan uh, program that we normally offer, we're offering it as a summer boot camp. So we have two options. The first option is June 8, uh, which is a Tuesday. This is the daytime option from 9.30 to 12.30. It will be a three hour session instead of a six week class where we'll be going through the different components of a business plan and then going through the live plan software. There is a fee for this program. Uh, it is $25, but it includes a one month subscription to the live plan software. Um, so please think about that, especially if you need a business plan to buy or sell your business. Um, in terms of um, our programming for the food industry, our, we have our next pandemic pivot sp speaker series for about food trucks on June 8 that afternoon from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, and we have the great speakers there talking about how they operate their food trucks and change during the pandemic. Then we have our June Women Business Leaders Breakfast Series. It is again a live stream. It will be from 8 to 9 a.m. And we have Sarah Meehan Parker, who is the CEO of Alpha Graphics, who will be speaking um, for our June breakfast. Then on to another program, and this is new. So if you or anybody you know is in the food industry or looking to start a food business, we're launching a new, new program called Food Startup Success. And this will start on June 17th. Uh, it will be six weeks, no class on July 1st, from 5.30 to 7. Um, and there is a $45 fee for that. And we're delighted to be partnering with our um, sister organization, Chatham University, which is CRAFT, the Center for Regional Agriculture and Food Transformation uh, for this program. Then on to the second uh, summer boot camp, which is on July, June 22nd, and that's from five to eight in the evening. And then I think our last program is June 23rd, which is our uh, webinar on marketing. The topic is how to create a champagne communications on a beer budget. So fun, fun, fun title. And we're delighted with Heather, uh, who is the founder of Motor Mount Multimedia, presenting that. And we'll have more programming throughout the summer as well. But this is what we've lined up right now for the rest of May and June. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we'll hope to see you at a future webinar. And uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.